it's me, Bussy, and welcome back to my show. And if you're new here, yes, all of my videos have been deleted due to a copyright strike fiasco, but we're trying to put all of that behind us and move forward. All of my old videos are available exclusively on my Patreon now, so if you're interested in watching them, that's where you can find them. Anyways, let's get into today's topic. We're over halfway through Canada's Drag Race at the time that I'm filming this, and it just seems that the judges can't get the placements correct. Furthermore, JBC, Jeffrey Boyer Chapman, just keeps digging himself into deeper and deeper holes. In fact, I think his name comes up more when discussing Canada's Drag Race than any of the other judges or contestants on the show. I think I can objectively say that the fans are not happy with his performance as a judge. People are signing change.org petitions, flooding the Canada's Drag Race social media with requests for his removal, and exiting queens are even saying that Jeffrey Boyer Chapman should consider being nicer in future seasons of Drag Race. I even asked my patrons what they thought of Jeffrey Boyer Chapman and if they thought he deserved an invite back to a potential season two of Canada's Drag Race. Here were the results. Is all of this hate for JBC warranted? I'm making this video not to jump on the hate train because I don't believe in spreading hate, but rather to try to critically analyze how we got to this point, compare his performance to the other judges, and see if we can't try to understand this whole thing from a different perspective. I'm going to be revisiting and reviewing some of the judges' most inflammatory critiques thus far. We're essentially going to be judging the judges on the Canada's Drag Race judging panel. By the end of this video, I hope to arrive at an answer to the question, should Jeffrey Boyer Chapman be invited back for a second season of Canada's Drag Race, and what about the other judges? But before we get into that, a quick message from today's sponsor, Surfshark, an award-winning VPN. Surfshark can be used to protect your personal identity on public Wi-Fi, block ads and trackers, and my personal favorite use, to watch every season of RuPaul's Drag Race and seasons four and five of All Stars on Netflix. This is what the US Netflix library looks like when you search for RuPaul's Drag Race. With Surfshark, I can set my location to any country in the world and then get access to that country's Netflix library. Switching to London, UK, for example, gives me access to Drag Race in an instant. Oh, and have you ever seen that message on YouTube where it says you can't watch it in your country? Well, just surf on to another country like Albania and voila, it's unblocked. And yes, Surfshark does work on your iPhone, Android, PC, and Mac with unlimited device login. Use my code BUSSY to get 85% off and an extra three months for free. And there's no risk in just trying it out because Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee. And make sure you act fast because this is your last chance to get this offer. So if you need a VPN or you already have one and you're just looking for a better one, then use the link in my description and use code BUSSY to get 85% off and three months free. Thank you so much to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Our esteemed panel of judges for Canada's Drag Race includes Brooklyn Heights, Stacey McKenzie, and the person in everyone's mouth Wait, that didn't sound right. Uh Take that back. Jeffrey Boyer Chapman. There is no main judge in this series, no final say. But RuPaul's Drag Race was created with one central figure in mind, RuPaul. I mean, his name is in the title of the show. It's very hard to separate this figurehead from his franchise. The show's closest TV sister is maybe like America's Next Top Model, which was essentially created to promote and advance Tyra Banks's career. RuPaul's Drag Race takes that to a whole new level. In the main branch of the Drag Race franchise, Rue is constantly reminding us that she's the queen bee. She does the announcements. She walks through the workroom for pep talks. She walks the main stage and announces the guest judges. She sits in the center of the judging panel, calls the girls her girls, and reminds us that ultimately the final decision is hers to make for every win and elimination. She tells us, basically without directly saying it, that she is the word of law and the other judges on the panel don't matter. So now that we've laid that out, I'm sure you're starting to see the problem that Canada's Drag Race presents. We've gone from seeing Drag Race exclusively through Rue's eyes to seeing Drag Race through a supermodel, a contestant from the main show who placed as a finalist, and a TV actor with a pretty short resume's eyes. No shade intended. However, that's pretty different different from Mama Rue Knows Best. Rue is, after all, arguably the most successful drag queen in the world. We've gone from one source of highly credible truth to three relatively unknown names. Brooklyn, of course, being the most famous of the three in our eyes and also having the most credibility. However, they've given her the exact same responsibility on the panel as two other people who were relatively unknown to fans of the franchise. So in my personal opinion, I do think the franchise is responsible for our 
when I say our, I mean us as fans, immediate distrust of what's going on in the show. Not one of them is RuPaul, and, and what, what are we supposed to think without RuPaul? Episode one, do you smell that? It's fresh maple syrup and Canadian pop culture references, with just a tinge of fracking and transphobia. <laughs> but that's not what today's video is about. The queens were challenged to design outfits using materials provided to them in cleverly named boxes. Think Canadian gay, must go and much rusic video prance. And look, I'm from America, and I don't know what half of these names meant, but it turns out the queen most ill-suited for this box challenge has box in her name. Go figure. Basically, Juicebox glues some CD shards to a hemless skirt and top. It wasn't great, but what the judges said gave her a panic attack on stage. And the show chose to air it. Reality TV at its finest. And I'm, I'm not laughing at her having a panic attack. I absolutely do not want to minimize mental health. I'm just laughing at the, the audaciousness that is this show. To her face, JBC says, I appreciate your cutesy style. Unfortunately, it's just not enough to cover up this outfit. It's sloppy, unpolished, and unfinished. Stacy says, this is messy. It's very safe. I'm looking for a positive and I just can't find it. Brooklyn chimes in, this is on brand for you. It's just a little basic. They hated it and they let her know. It was reminiscent of that time that Michelle made Adore Delano quit All Stars. <laughs> However, it just wasn't that they all hated it. It was that they kept railing into her even though you could visibly see her mental state cracking with each new critique. Say crack again. On top of that, none of these critiques were constructive. They basically just told her it sucked over and over again. And it did, but judges are supposed to tell you how to improve, not just tear you down until you're a shell of a human collapsing on the stage of a nationally televised reality TV competition. Behind the scenes while the girls untucked, it got worse. Brooklyn goes on to describe her outfit as a party city Wilma Flintstone. Jeffrey describes her wig as a shake and go and continues to lay into the unpolishedness of the outfit. And by the way, he's using that adjective wrong. That was not a shake and go wig. A shake and go wig is when you just take a wig out of the bag and throw it on your head with no styling. She very clearly was wearing a styled ponytail with a clip and bang. It took at least a little bit of effort. But I think we actually have to count that one in the bucket of JBC isn't a credible judge. He didn't really know what shake and go meant. It's probably just something he heard used to describe bad hair. And so he just threw that in as a jab. So using drag related terminology in correctly when judging a drag competition on the very first episode isn't exactly helping his credibility off the bat as a judge on the show, but to be totally fair, all the judges were pretty ruthless in their critiques. Concerning the other contestants, Brooklyn thanks Lemon for her performance on the runway, even though it was off-Broadway. Off. Off. Broadway. And tells Kine her runway walk looked like she was coming home from a grinder hookup. <laughs> And it's not that these jokes aren't funny. I'm very clearly laughing as I read them back, but she's making fun of contestants to their face. The judges applaud Jimbo and Rita across the board. However, Jimbo's outfit was clearly more detailed, better constructed, and had more spirit behind it. Rita was wearing socks glued to a cape over a blue potato sack. <laughs> Rita secures the win, and to that I say, each their own. However, remember this placing dynamic as it becomes a running theme throughout the following episodes in their critiques. So strike one for the judges? They were rude to the girls in the bottom, gave one a panic attack, and gave the win, in my opinion, to the wrong girl. Maybe even the girl that had the worst look on the stage. To focus only on Jeffrey's critiques would be irresponsible. That was rough. Episode two. The girls overreacted in parodies of Heritage Minutes and recreated their first time in drag. Lemon receives praise from all the judges on both her acting chops and look. She wins this challenge and the critiques aren't really notable or relevant to our story today. However, Jimbo does also receive a bunch of positive critique. Jeffrey says she was prepared and knew all of her lines. Concerning Jimbo's look, he says she is terrifying him and he loves it. And Brooklyn says, wow. The guest judge says Jimbo is the reason he watches Drag Race. They do ask her to act a bit larger next time, but she doesn't really receive any negative critiques. Kine, our eliminated queen this episode, does receive some negative critiques. Concerning her outfit, Jeffrey says, when you turn around, you can see that peak of skin that is your skin color, and it takes me out of the fantasy of it, the illusion of it. This critique foreshadows a future critique of his, so just place this one in your back pocket. And while Kine's runway wasn't good, focusing on a peak of skin poking out from 
from the back of a corset seems a little weird. Well, why not just suggest some improvements to the outfit overall? He seems to suggest that painting those little skin pops purple would have kept him in some sort of fantasy about her look, but I think all the purple back paint in the world wouldn't have fixed that look. To his credit, he does at least provide something constructive, if a bit misguided. And Tai Nomi, remember her? She has trouble acting in the main challenge, and Jeffrey says, the fact that you are new to this isn't very relevant because Lemon is as well and she slayed the game. Thank you, Tainomi. He manages to be dismissive and also provide no constructive criticism. He basically just told her she sucked without giving her any suggestions on how to improve her acting skills. And don't forget, he's the actor on the panel. Shouldn't he be the one that could provide advice best in an acting challenge? Jeffrey did manage to deliver both the most nonsensical critique to Kine and the rudest critique to Tainomi. Strike two for Jeffrey? He came off pretty rude and the other judges weren't so bad. Episode three, the diswrap and hair runway. I think this episode is an excellent one with which to compare delivery of negative critique. Tainomi is on the chopping block for her less than stellar performance in the diswrap. GBC says, I was watching you dancing. I was also watching you forget your lyrics, which was disappointing. You wrote the words. He basically just tells her she forgot her words, which did happen, but does he really need to pour salt in the wound with the delivery? Tainomi knows she forgot her words, and again, he missed the opportunity to provide some actionable advice. This was another, you sucked, I'm disappointed delivered in a terrible tone. Deborah Cox, our guest judge this episode, does feel similarly to Jeffrey Boyer Chapman, but delivers her message much more eloquently. She sounds like a cheer coach giving a pep talk rather than a bully stealing your lunch money. She explains why lyrics are important to a song. She says they help deliver the message of a performance. See how much nicer that is than saying, I was watching you forget your lyrics, which was disappointing, but how both convey the same message? As for the other girls, JBC tells Alona, her taste level is on point while telling Kiara that her look is a little bit basic and her performance look was also basic and says that she was basic last week too, <laughs> ultimately bringing poor little Kiara to tears. My problem with this critique in particular is that once again, he manages to tell a contestant that they sucked like all around. <laughs> and like, also what, like, what does basic mean to you, JVC? Like, wh how is that supposed to help a contestant. It, like, how can she go into the next runway or challenge and be like, I'm gonna be less basic this time? Like, like tell her that her outfit could be tailored better or her wig could be styled differently or she could use better facial expression in the mean challenge. Like, there's a whole host of things you could have told her to actually help her. And anyway, isn't that word basic kind of 2000 and late? <laughs> My point is judges should be more articulate in what they're saying and give actionable advice. So strike three for Jeffrey, he made a girl cry. Episode four, the recycled materials challenge. This is the episode that really did it for a lot of people. This is another design challenge, but this time the girls are split into fashion houses and have to create cohesive looks using paper, plastic, and metal. Plastic wins and was obviously the best of the bunch, but in general, I think people were extremely upset about the judging this episode because most viewers saw metal as being the bottom house. However, the judges saw paper as the bottom house. I I think this was more of an issue of the challenge being lost in translation, though. Concerning the House of Metal, the judges rave over Priyanka's look. She was just as surprised as we were as viewers. <laughs> Brooklyn looks her dead in the eye and says, Ugh, Priyanka, this was such a serve for me tonight. In response, Priyanka goes, Seriously? <laughs> Stacy goes on to tell Priyanka that she was giving high fashion couture model on the runway. JBC says, this dress was so beautiful. I can only imagine how hard it was to construct. I mean, are we looking at the same thing? They act like she just invented fashion when in reality, she looks like a Wizard of Oz and ring crossover. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be shady. I love Priyanka, but like, come on. Anyways, back to the reason we're all here. <laughs> the negative critique. To Alona, Brooklyn says, I got gay pride at the Renaissance Fair more than I did runway show. It looks like I should hang you in my backyard and beat you with a stick. <laughs> uh, and just so that I'm not misconstruing her message, she is making a joke about Ilona looking like a pinata, but still, that is rough. Brooklyn, again, makes fun of a contestant to their face. And I don't know, that just comes off as like wrong to me. Like to make 
punny jokes about a contestant as they walk down the runway is one thing, but to berate them to their face when they already know that they're in the bottom just kind of feels like kicking a dog while they're down. Finally, the big moment of the episode. Jimbo gets some mixed critiques here. Brooklyn tells her the look is impressive. The guest judge is confused about her white face and JBC says, your face is beat, your chest is beat, but your arms and hands are a different color. You didn't even touch them with your makeup and it drives me nuts. It takes me out of the illusion and the fantasy immediately. Remember, by the way, that's the same thing he said about Kine earlier with the makeup on her back. I don't know, I just thought it was worth noting that he keeps reusing the same critiques. In response, Jimbo says she didn't have time to paint her arms and hands. JBC says, I hear you girl. Everyone gets the same amount of time. Use it better maybe. <laughs> and there are a few problems with his critiques here. Firstly, he's describing her chest as beat. I think he's using that word as a general term for like has makeup on, but really in the drag world, you say someone is beat when their makeup is on point. On fleek, as the kids are saying, right? So that was a little weird to hear. We can put that in the JBC has a no drag knowledge mouth category. It is, however, understandable that he would want the arms and hands to be painted white if she was going to paint her face white. But then we get into that sassy little retort that he gives Jimbo when she's trying to explain why she couldn't deliver what he was asking for. Use it better, maybe. It's just so unnecessary. Like, like who talks like that? Much less to a person that you're supposed to be uplifting and providing constructive criticism to. If someone spoke to me like that, I would lose it. Behind the scenes, JBC says, I'm losing Jimbo a little bit. I'm just not seeing the same fire I saw the first couple of weeks in the competition and I'm wondering where she's going. This is kind of weird because like, I think we can all acknowledge that Jimbo clearly put in a lot of effort into her look. Brooklyn even said the look was impressive. Remember, she's the drag queen on the judging panel. So I think we can really kind of chalk up his feelings here to Jimbo responding to his critique in a way that he was not happy with. So the judges really were all over the place this episode. Let's go ahead and give all the judges a strike and give Jeffrey an extra strike for that use it better maybe comment. Moving into episode five, Snatch Game. And Celine, why why do they say her name? I, I don't know. Truthfully, this was a great episode for everyone involved. Jumbo finally secures a win with her Joan Rivers, and Kiara is sent home for her Mariah Scary. Some people were upset, however, that Brooklyn asked Lemon to cinch. This is a pretty mild critique, although I don't think cinching was really the problem, because you can only really cinch your body so much, especially if you're muscular like Lemon is. I think she just needed to pad her hips to give her body the more womanly shape that Brooklyn was looking for. I do also want to point out here that Rita's outfits were horrendous, but the judges don't even really acknowledge that. Brooklyn says Rita's runway look was an odd choice, and JBC doesn't like the white one, but seems to suggest that the reveal was really good. It seems like the judges sort of pick and choose when to critique queens, and don't ever really give negative critiques to their faves, like Rita. Brooklyn certainly doesn't make fun of her, and I have yet to see JBC give her some weird sassy retort. I smell favoritism. But I won't give any strikes here, as the judges weren't really mean, they were just kind of not being great judges. Episode six, the girls have to make legal aid comedy sketches and sell a denim runway look. To Alona, JBC says, I think your mug is painted so gorgeously. However, when I see that booty and the little turnaround, a little full coverage foundation might have helped you out. He also says it seems she didn't have the clearest direction of where she was going in the acting challenge. Brooklyn agrees on both counts. She said her performance was very one note and behind the scenes, she said that she should have quote, put some makeup on that. Stacy seems to enjoy the look. Firstly, I think it's important to contextualize the outcries and the critique about Alona's butt. On TV, it didn't read as needing makeup if a butt ever does need makeup. However, we have no idea what her butt looked like in person to their credit. All we know is that Alona felt confident enough to show off her butt skin and the judges were not happy about it. I don't think the judges were particularly rude about this critique, but it just didn't make sense to us as viewers. Even Alona in a recent interview says she wasn't really phased about the foundation comment when it happened. I think we were all just hyper aware of what Jeffrey was saying and we were looking for that next use it better maybe 
moment. I think it's also worth noting that we as humans are more likely to perceive somebody's negative comment as bullying when we already perceive them as a bully. If Stacy had said the same exact thing, there certainly would not have been public outcry about it. And don't forget that Brooklyn agreed with JBC. I actually think the bigger problem with Jeffrey and Brooklyn's critiques on Alona was about their critiques on her performance in the main challenge. They praised Scarlett's character, but said Alona's was one note. To me, they were the same. This also was the episode where Jimbo has her, it's my special day moment. This is also the episode where Jimbo gets robbed blind. In Jimbo's critique, JBC starts out quoting, it's my special day, and then says, hello Jimbo, welcome to the competition, honey. Uh, using both a condescending voice and a pet name. He loves her look, as do the rest of the judges, and behind the scenes he says, she has taken our critiques to let that star power shine through and she is running with it. Brooklyn says her look is fantastic. Her only challenge, keep surprising them. She receives no negative critiques. Then we move over to Rita. Firstly, Rita isn't even wearing denim or nails. JBC tells her it is the most beautiful he has ever seen her and that he couldn't take his eyes off her in the comedy sketch. Brooklyn tells her she needs an ass bad, but that she looks great. Behind the scenes, JBC says he wants to see Rita's it factor shining through more. So the opposite of what he said about Jimbo. It sounds like based on those critiques, they would give the win to Jimbo. However, they give the win to Rita. In what world does this make sense? How did the person with zero negative critiques, an amazing performance and the best look not win? Only on Canada's Drag Race. Multiple strikes for all of the judges. Basically, we've lost all hope for the show at this point to make any sense. And finally, our most recent episode, Miss Loose Jaw. Just a warning, the judges have reached their pinnacle of insanity on this episode. Brooklyn starts off with Alona, telling her her hair looks like George Washington meets Dame Edna. Lemon is praised all around and does end up winning, but more concerning, again, are the placements of Jimbo and Rita this episode. JBC tells Jimbo, I think I laughed the hardest at what you brought to the pageant. Concerning the look, he says it doesn't look glamorous by any means, but that it is campy and on brand? What is that even supposed to mean? Aliex tells Jimbo she was her favorite. Brooklyn says, it looks like we had another design challenge and you had to make this. Behind the scenes, JBC says her look was turd city and Brooklyn says it was the worst she has looked all season. Stacy is nicer and just says she doesn't like the hair or dress. It's a pretty scathing review for Jimbo in my opinion, but the judges did also pretty much tell her she had the best performance in the challenge. For Brooklyn to tell Jimbo that her look is arts and craftsy and reminiscent of a design challenge is furtherly confusing Using me because previously, if you remember Brooklyn's critiques on Jimbo's design challenges, she said that they were creative and impressive, yet she uses this critique here as an insult. Okay. Rita Bega hears from JBC that he didn't understand her character. Brooklyn tells her they wanted more diversity in the pageant, but that the dress is great. Stacy compliments her runway. Ali X does not like the hair, and the hair is a whole other topic but we're, we're not gonna get into that. The final placement in this episode puts Jimbo as low and Rita Baga is safe. According to the judges, Jimbo seemed to be the favorite in the challenge, but their least favorite in the runway. They said Rita's challenge performance was not good, but the judges liked Rita's more than Jimbo's, which again brings into question, how the hell are they weighing runways and challenges? And traditionally in the Drag Race franchise, it's always felt more like runways were kind of there to break a tie on a win, rather than to place someone is low even though they had the best performance in the main challenge. In Canada's Drag Race, however, it just feels like they're applying the runway weight however they feel is necessary to swing favor to Rita. Strikes for everyone again. Now, having combed through seven episodes of critique, a couple of things have become apparent. And using my very scientific striking method as a guide for our conclusion, we can see that the judges give a lot of negative critique. We also saw that they give a lot of general negative critique. When you're giving feedback to someone, it can be positive or negative and general or specific. It looks like this kind of on a graph. Specific critique is always the best kind because it's actionable. You can hear it and then know what to repeat or what to not do again in the future. As an example, general positive feedback is kind of like giving somebody a high five or telling them good job. It makes them feel better, but they don't really know how to repeat the good 
and the good job compliment and general negative critique is like, you suck. It just makes somebody feel bad and doesn't help them understand why you think they sucked. At their worst, the judges make fun of the contestants to their faces. Brooklyn, looking at you. And it feels like Jeffrey and Brooklyn are often in a race to dish out their meanest mean girl lines. It doesn't help that Jeffrey's delivery is objectively worse than Brooklyn's. Everything he says is laced with a snarky undertone. It's like he's trying to assert his dominance over these contestants, but for what? I would only guess that he's insecure about his own casting as a judge, and he feels it's the only way to control power in his situation. And as for Brooklyn, I think people are more used to the idea that it drag queen can throw shade to her sister and sort of not get in trouble for it. But I'd argue that Brooklyn is actually abusing her place of power in this competition by making fun of contestants. I don't think it's fair to constantly throw shade at the people that you're supposed to be uplifting. Next, we also saw that the judges were inconsistent in what they were saying across episodes and even within episodes. How can JBC snarkily welcome Jim Pope to the competition in episode six when she literally just won the prior episode? It's condescending. Why is Brooklyn saying Jimbo's look is comparative to her design challenges in a negative way when she previously expressed that she liked her design challenge creations? And then within episodes, they'll give no negative critiques to people like Jimbo and then place her below someone like Rita they gave negative critiques to. Yes, I know that I am heavily focusing on Jimbo and Rita here, but that's because there's a clear favoritism and preference for Rita over Jimbo, and Jimbo is turning out to be the fan favorite. Finally, although Jeffrey's comments are particularly unpalatable, he is not alone in being a bad judge. Brooklyn is definitely his partner in crime. They share equal responsibility in judging and are equally responsible for the bizarre placements in the episodes. Stacy was mostly absent from my analysis because for a lack of a better term, her critiques were mostly throwaways. Her tone is never pointed and she never really makes fun of anyone. She's basically an angel. She can stay. However, to play devil's advocate, I must also point out that she shares the same amount of responsibility that Brooklyn and JBC share on the panel. So while all three judges are to blame for the placements and the outcomes of the episodes, I believe Jeffrey is being targeted by the general public for a couple of reasons, primarily because he has specifically targeted the fan favorite Jimbo on multiple occasions. Secondly, I think he's an easy target because the fan base loves Brooklyn Heights, or did. I, I think the tides may, may be turning there. In terms of audience perception, basically he started out in the middle like of a scale at zero and has quickly sunk into the negatives. On top of that, a general audience member will give more credibility to the drag queen on the panel, I believe. If the drag queen says it sucks, well, then the average person will probably believe that it sucks. I found this to be true in my own videos. I get really weird comments on the videos where I critique the show as a boy, which is kind of the reason I did today's video out of drag, just to prove a point and see what happens. Also, I think we're seeing the bandwagon effect happen with his character. It's easy to jump on the hate train if it's already moving, and we are in cancel season after all. People want a villain. They want someone to take down. And finally, I think people are tired of the old judging panel archetype of having a bad judge. It's just not exciting to hear somebody be mean, especially to someone you like. On top of the fact that it's directly opposing one of the main motifs of the show. Everybody say love. Ultimately, Canada's Drag Race is reality TV, and drag Drag Race is in the business of selling a product. The product is entertainment. And let's be real, Jeffrey's performance as a judge has gotten more people talking about Canada's Drag Race than All Stars. People are rallying around their dislike for his character. It's something everyone can agree with, and it's entertaining as hell to see him act a fool. All press is good press. This is a season of Drag Race that people won't forget, thanks to him and the other judges. But should he or they be invited back for a season two? In my personal opinion, I don't think an internet nationally successful show needs to rely on contestant beratement to achieve entertainment. I think change is necessary, but I don't think calling for his removal specifically is fair. After all, this is Jeffrey's first time doing something like this. And I think it's important to recognize Jeffrey could be contractually obligated to be a bad judge. He could even be scripted. We have no idea. He certainly didn't act like this when he was a guest judge in the main show in the past. Plus, as we've seen, Brooklyn's not been very nice either. So if your argument is for his removal, why would you 
you not call to remove them both? Also, regardless of whether or not he's playing up his character over the cameras, I seriously doubt anyone with any sort of self-awareness would deliver that same performance given another opportunity. He very clearly is seeing everyone calling for his removal, and he would have to have the largest ego in the world, I mean, I'm talking like Kanye West size, to see the fans reacting to him like this and not change. But then again, maybe he does. I would love to see him address this situation, of which he hasn't done. Interact with the fans, explain your critiques, talk to us. Instead, he's walled himself off from the world. He hasn't tweeted since August 1st, and he's turned off comments on his Instagram posts. His bio currently reads, good vibes only. But let's give him, JBC, and the other judges benefit of the doubt and end the witch hunt. I don't think calling for his or any of the other judges' removal is fair. They were hired to do a job and they're doing it. Let's finish the rest of the season, get as mad as we want, and then hope that they fix it for season two. But there's no reason to send anybody hate at all. And if they don't fix it in season two, then maybe it's time to call for the removal of the judges. My channel is made possible by my generous and loving family of patrons. I could not do it without them. If you would like to help me make videos and get things like early access, your name and credits, personal shout outs, you can join my Patreon over on patreon.com slash bussyqueen. I'd also like to give a special shout out to Alex, Blythe, Caroline, Catherine, Chris, Crystal, Curtis, Derek, Ed, Elizabeth, Elvin, Hannah, Hassan, Ivan, James, Janine, Jenny, Joseph, Kevin, Kind of Emo, Kind of White Girl, Maxwell, Michelle, Miguel, Oscar V, Oscar D, Terry, Rick, Stephanie, Susan, Taco Sita, Timotheus, Vanessa, Veronica, Zincat, Midnight19, and Drew, who were all supporting me at the hot tier. Bradley, Craig, Glenn, Kiki, and John, Mike, Nix, Sailor, Shannon, Sunshine, and Tina, who are all supporting me at the hottest hot tier, and Marty, Matthew, and Tom, who are all supporting me at the Bussy Queen Collector tier. Thanks so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to press a like and hit that subscribe button if you're not subscribed already. I'll see you guys in the next video. Love you!